famous quote here. So the Soviet tradition is bound and liberated by the temporal echoes of Marx, who, who counseled in the 18th Brumaire, the social revolution cannot draw its poetry from the past, but only from the future. These words were famously cited also by post-colonial thinker Franz Fanon in Black Skin, White Masks, marking the continuation of a tradition of radical Marxist post-colonial and Afrofuturist thought, which was fought for a century for historical recovery of the Black Atlantic against the whiteness of the Euro-American canon. In so doing, Afrofuturism not only renders visible the black subject in time, but demonstrates the ways in which black technologies expose the conditions of modern alienation. Soviet time is already, is, is always already embroiled in the temporality of the future past, perhaps best remembered in the aesthetics of the revolutionary avant-garde or the Russian Soviet sci-fi tradition, ever conscious of its Eurasian belatedness in relation to European modernity. I introduce ethnofuturism as a term in dialogue with Afrofuturism in discussions of queer utopianism, not only as a historical recovery of literature, film, and the arts of this former Soviet Muslim periphery, but to insist on the importance of the non-Russian and Muslim subjects' experience to better understand the conditions of Soviet and post-Soviet modernity. And here you can see a, um, a still from Ashik Kirib uh, and its resonance with one of uh, Sun Ra's uh, portraits. And um, I found recently, just last night, that Sun Ra would have to be in Tbilisi a year after the, um, a year after uh, Ashik Kirib came out in 1989 for a jazz conference. Um, <coughs> And here, I understand the term post-Soviet broadly, not only as an area studies division, but as an invocation of the history of the Soviet experience as it intersected with black American and decolonizing African, Arab, and Latin American experiences. In this way, the reconstruction of Soviet ethnofuturity not only foregrounds forms of non-Russian ethnic, feminist, and queer subjectivity on the former Soviet periphery, but envisions a critical alternative to both political nihilism and the rising traditionalism of contemporary new right politics and its attendant forms of patriarchal white supremacy. I want to note here that while I'm making an effort to frame the broader historical stakes of this project, I'm also, um, I also want to underscore that this reading of ethnofuturism is explicitly grounded in a historical understanding of language and culture that does not seek to collapse historical experience on the Soviet periphery into some universalist queer utopia. Instead, my reading of ethnofuturism frames temporality through a Marxist vision of the historicity of Soviet ethnos and the Orientalist tradition, um, the Orientalist invent invention of nations. In this way, I argue that a return to the epistemological and historical foundations of Soviet Orientalist ethnography and literature and art of the post-Soviet periphery can offer important insight into our present Cold War political reality. My discussion today will focus on the films of Sergei Parajanov, particularly two strange love stories, The Color of Pomegranates and Ashik Kitty, which narrate the life of the 18th century poet Syed Nova and the folk bard Ashik Kitty, respectively. Drawing on literary subjects and the genres of poetry in the folk tale, the film construct the films confront the construction of nationalist culture through their thematization of a national canon. Refusing the confining registers of national Soviet identity, Parajanov's films also reject both visions of the heterosexual or cisgender Soviet male as the embodiment of the revolutionary spirit and the Soviet Orientalist representation of homosexuality in the Caucasus and Central Asia as a primitive vestige of the past. Parajanov's cinematic tableau vivant produced surreal imaginaries that rely on sensuous thought, a formal device from the 1920s avant-garde drawn from Marxist psychoanalysis. Parajanov's embrace of sensuous thought rejects the location of politics within the symbolic economy of Soviet nation-building, 
instead investing meaning in the sensorial and affective registers of the film. In this way, I argue, his films propose alternative modes of being and collective futures imagined through a queer performance of Soviet Orientalism in his sensuous presentation of strange loves that resist categorization. While much has been written on Parajanov's aesthetics, the politics of his film have, have received less attention perhaps because they do not take up directly identity discourses. Instead, I argue following a contemporary line of queer theory, the work of Michael Warner, Lisa Dugan, Lauren Berlant, Cara Keeling, and Jose Munoz, which rejects the neoliberal normalization of homosexuality to locate politics within the aesthetic tissue of the work itself. This talk will thus focus on the effective politics of Parajanov's films, conjuring alternative and fantastic worlds through acts of love, both poetic and intimate, though not bound by the commodification and codification of institutional discourses. In this sense, I argue that Parajanov's reliance on the surreal, which ostensibly dis di distances its work from its political context, also returns to it new playful and creative possibilities. His films represent sensual possibilities through their disaggregation of time, space, and the self in his fantastic imaginings of poetry and folk tales through his cinematic tableau vivant. Parashanov employs these tableaux uh, to highlight the ways in which sensuous thought articulates alternative spaces of belonging and the interaction between still and moving images as well as visual and sonic textures. Parashanov's rejection of linear narrative time shifts focus of, of, uh, uh, instead to the effective registers of the filmic collage, revealing the personality of the characters in the interaction between still and moving images, between filmic diegesis and the flatness of painting, as well as between the face and the mask, the self and its performance. Appropriating avant-garde aesthetics, Parajana's film, films conjure the revolutionary history during which these modernist exper experiments first emerged, and in turn, the contemporaneous invention of the National Republic. The p political value of national art was framed through its, val uh, its validation of a process which historian Francine Hirsch has famously called double assimilation, whereby Soviet Orientalists catalogued, defined, and to a certain extent invented national cultures, assimilating diverse peoples into nations and in turn into the great Soviet nation. Central to this process of double assimilation was Stalin's definition of a nation as a historically constituted, stable community of people, formed on the basis of a common language, territory, economic life, and psychological makeup manifested in a common culture. In Russian and Soviet Orientalist ethnographic discourse, ethnic minorities were accorded a territory and historical temporality which, for instance, presented Muslims of the North Caucasus as uh, mountain-dwelling peoples locked in a stage of tribal feudalism and who must therefore, who must historically evolve and assimilate into a uniform modern Soviet civilization. And, and this, this, um, this ethnographic discourse, a lot of it derives from tendencies in, um, in linguistic theory of the early 20s, which I've also written on, which um, and Patrick Serio's book on is fabulous, called the, um, to, um, about the way in which um, basically a lot of this linguistic theory drew from non-Darwinian biological evolution or nomogenesis um, and the notion of that local forms of local variation must still be assumed within um, the idea of a cultural, geographic, scientific, and economic totality of the Soviet state. Parajanov's tableau vivants instead generate a vision of mythic supranational or perhaps postnational futurity, drawing upon cultural icons from the 18th century Caucasus before the creation of nation states. He generates a cultural and linguistic topography that obscures the singularity of an Armenian or a Georgian or Azerbaijani national culture, as well as the confessional difference between Eastern Orthodoxy and Islam and the opposition between subject and object, spirit and matter. And um, these will formulate my um, three major points today of this talk. 
ethnography, icons, and the objects that sound. So first, ethnography. Um, highlighting this inherently contra this inherent contradiction between the national between national narrative, the color of pomegranates was proposed as a remembrance of Armenia's national poet Syed Nova, though much of his verse was written in Azeri Turkic Persian um, and, and Armenian as well. Um, and as she Kirib in as an Azerbaijani folktale, though Parajanov notably credited Lermontov's Russian translation of a Turkic tale as, as its inspiration. As Perjana claims in interviews, uh, Ashik Kiriv was, quote, shot as a documentary of Lermontov's short story of the same name. Perjana's invitation of the Russian Romantic Orientalist tradition through Lermontov's story thus documents the imperial imagination itself. Perjana's surreal costuming, theatrical gesture, and static shots render the Caucasus an infinite and fantastic space, a space without borders and a time without end, blending cultural objects from multiple traditions and reimagining costumes for contemporary everyday objects. He generates an impossible portrait of both Soviet and national culture. In this way, the figures of the minstrels Syed Nova and Ashikiri set up false symbols of national form, poetry, and folk tales, which Parajan disassembles in his surrealist fusions of pan-Caucasian culture. Ashik Kirib's framing as a documentary of an Orientalist tale highlights the tension between the imaginative or fictive and, et and ethnographic. While Lermontov's tale offers instruction to his Russian audience in footnotes on the language, topography, and cultural traditions of the Turkic Caucasus, Parajanov instead presents a surreal vision of Nadir Shah's empire imagined through the textures of his tableau vivant. The costuming of characters is both stylized and tends toward excess. A sheik is frequently swathed in an abundance of textiles drawn from Uzbekistan to China, or depicted in a white in a white face makeup that recalls the Commedia dell'arte. Parajanov also draws on popular surrealist and Dada objects such as here the buttons. Um, as ornamentation, which are echoed in many of his collage works. While Perjano's fantastic costuming often seems to orientalize his subjects, his cinematic gaze remains aware of its own staging. For instance, here when Ashik is visiting um, the Shah, Perjanov captures the character's self-disguise as he removes the beard, the guard's beard, and applies it to his own face, highlighting the artificiality of the costuming. Similarly, for the film soundtrack, Perjanov commissioned Azerbaijani composer, um, an Azerbaijani composer, to blend traditional Muham music with with Ave Maria, Schubert and Gluck. And in an interview, he explains. What we wanted European viewers to connect Ave Maria to the Muslim world. In this way, he offers his viewers an aesthetic disorientation of their image of the Caucasus as something strangely familiar. For Perjanov, however, the culture, this cultural pastiche is organized and set around formal principles. In, a 19, in 1966, he writes, I was able to translate ethnographic material. We intentionally gave ourselves up to the material, its rhythm and style, so that the literature, history, ethnography, and philosophy would fuse into a single cinematic image, a single act. In his fusion or transgression of genre and media, the sensuousness of the cinematic form emerges as the organizational principle of Parashana's design. His vision of culture thus reclaims the sensuous elements of film over an attempt to catalog content. <clears throat> Icons. The form of the tableau vivant stresses the intersection of painting, sculpture, and theater. That is, the very heart of this aesthetic innovation lies in an impure intersection of media and genres. Indeed, Parajanov worked quite prolifically in, in collage, as I mentioned, his works share in the cinematic tableau's fascination with multimedia, its preoccupation with flatness and texture and surface, as well as the reappropriation and veneration of everyday inanimate objects as artistic subjects. As you can see, Parajanov's collage work also recalls orthodox iconography, 
his interest in the semiotics of the icon. Um, <clears throat> much like that of the, of the avant-garde Italian filmmaker, uh, Piero Pasolini, centers on the function of the icon, not as a symbol for the divine, but as an object that itself embodies the material evidence of the incarnation of the sacred in the world. The value of the icon is this not located in its symbolic function, but rather in its very materiality. <clears throat> Indeed, Perizono's films not only engage with the aesthetics and semiotic functions of iconography, but directly thematize the icon as part of a negotiation of the value of cultural symbols. In Lermontov's translation, he employs a parenthetical gloss for his Russian readers, equating the Sufi saint, al Hidr, who returns Ashik to his beloved as the Orthodox Saint George. Perzhanov, in turn, frames this intercultural translation through his use of iconography in his cinematic tableau. <clears throat> In two successive scenes entitled The Defiled Habitation and There is One God, are, they're formally linked by the repetition of a tableau of a chic just uh, in Georgian costume surrounded by children against a backdrop of snow-covered ruins holding the icon of St. George. El Hidr, on the other hand, is integrated into the diegetic narrative of the film, transporting a chic home in a later scene. However, the tableau, removed from the diegetic narrative, functions as an icon. Ashik is assembled in this still image with his saws reflect, uh, replacing St. George's sword, while he is welcomed by a group of school children holding the icon. And then later, beaten by a band of local men mounted on horseback, proclaiming, anyone who travels in a foreign land is an enemy. We are all enemies. Perjana's suspension of time in the tableau materializes a chic saz as a weapon against hostility and concretizes the link between hospitality and the unity of God, reflecting the titles, reflected in the titles of the two scenes. Indeed, Perjan specifically added these two scenes after the initial editing to respond to inter-ethnic violence in Karabakh that year. And this is what I'm arguing in particular about a chic kerib, that even while it imagines a kind of timeless non-place to evoke the, the definition of utopia. It is also very grounded in this moment um, um, of inter-ethnic violence um, in the Caucasus. This connection is also echoed, echoed in the orthodox notion of spiritual unity or sobor most of the church, or sobor, as both physical and spiritual dwelling which is materialized in the ruins here of the defiled habitation, the connection between our strange lover and the sacred icon thus establishes a nonverbal extra diegetic continuity between the fragmented scenes. As Dan Haley notes, the revolution generated a shift from the use of spiritual and poetic terminology rooted in the religious discourse um, for the description of sexual acts to the appropriation of a, quote, modern medical discourse in the Soviet Union. Parajana's representations of forms of hybridized spirituality made visible at the surface of the icon speak to future post-Soviet, post-national discourse of queerness that draws on the poetics of this pre-revolutionary past. The evocation of a plurality of sacred images also shifts the discourse of sexuality away from its role in mediating a relationship to Western modernity to one that aims to recover and invent new ways of being human. So the final section, objects that sound. Most central to Parajanov's project is his rejection of narrative time for the still frames of the tableau vivant. As I previously mentioned, this technique operates through a, th a theory of sensuous thought developed in the 1920s poetic school of film, popularized by Sergei Eisenstein. Um, indebted to the Marxist psychologist Lev Vygotsky's theory of inner speech, this largely wordless form of speech replaces an emphasis on phonetics with semantic meanings produced non-verbally and perceived through the sensations of sound and vision. 
Eisenstein, alongside formalist linguists such as Boris Echenbaum and Roman Jakobsen, highlighted the role of inner speech in providing nonverbal linkages between scenes. Achenbaum writes, the internal speech of the film lure formed on the basis of frames is not realized as an exact verbal formation. Achenbaum distinguished the use of metaphor in film, which is dependent on the, verb, uh, the, the viewer's verbal baggage, to the real significance of internal speech, not as an accidental psychological element of film perception, but as an integral structural element of the film. Eisenstein calls internal speech sensuous thought, the medium through which one experiences film. Sensuous thought, like iconography, does not function mimetically, but rather through the materialization of thought itself. In this way, film creates chains of signification through sensuous thoughts, which in turn expose the sum total of psychological events of human consciousness. Or, as Eisenstein writes, the psychological sum total of the resonance of the shot as a whole, as a complex unity of all its component stimulants taken to be the general sign of the shot. This is the particular feeling that the shot as a whole produces. In connection to a pre-verbal unconscious, inner speech in film realizes the film viewer's unconscious thoughts, memories, and desires. Eisenstein writes that sound and image work to generate a generalized, projected emotional effect. These conceptions of the sensuous emotional affect underlying the poetic film tradition and formalist theory could also be framed through affect theory. Gilles Deleuze's description of affect as a motor tendency on a, sensu a sensitive nerve is thus in a way prefigured by Soviet theories such as Alexei Gostyev's vision of thoughts, mat material, and social mediation through the reflexes of the body or collective bodies. More broadly in this vein, many scholars have also traced striking resonances to the relationship between translinguistic Soviet theories and the work of Mikhail Bakhtin uh, and the entire school indebted to Vygotsky's work and post-structuralist theories that aim to transcend the verbal. Parajanov's invocation of Soviet aesthetic theory indebted to this Marxist psych, uh, psychoanalysis thus exposes an alternative virtual affective tradition, one not driven by the late capitalist individual, as Deleuze would have it, but rather Soviet visions of modernization. For Parajanov, the sensuousness of the tableau thus articulates its function to generate a visceral response from the viewer. His focus on the materiality of the flattened tableau in the turn animates his filmic gaze as integral to the economy of desire in the film. Parajanov's attention to the texture of the found object is here central to the relationship between his collages and cinematic tableau, at once evoking contemporary artistic movements, pop art, and sots arts play within the iconography of capitalist and socialist realisms. Parajanov employs the collage form to challenge the opposition between matter and spirit, generating what Fred Moten calls objects or commodities that sound. That is, as Moten writes of the improvisational aesthetic of the black radical tradition in his beautiful book, In the Break, quote, part of this project is the drive that animates this improvisation through the opposition of spirit and matter that is instantiated when the object, the commodity, sounds. Moten here disrupts a notion of a proper Marxist formulation of sociality and exchange with the impropriety of the exchange value that precedes exchange. In this way, he offers a critical rethinking of Marx's impossible speaking commodity, arguing instead that the resistance of the object speaks precisely to the history of the black subject. My engagement with Moten here, which is unfortunately beyond the scope of this talk, gestures toward a larger project. More broadly, I'd like to understand the relationship between visual culture and performance art on the late Soviet periphery through the fall of the Soviet Union as a practice of reimagining Soviet subjectivity through the creation of alternative forms 
of belonging formulated through this aesthetics of improvisation and effective structures of the ensemble. And part of this larger project entails a discussion of what I promised but unfortunately don't have time to deliver of the, the anti-nationalist world-making project of the Tashkent-based Ilkholm Theater and their engagement with diverse forms of textual and physical improvisation through the blends of, of the Central Asian tradition of the Mashrabos and the avant-garde Soviet theater methods. Um, and most of the work plays on modernity discourses drawn from both Russian Orientalist and Muslim modernist literature, focusing on figures such as Ustam Amin, Alexander Nikolaev, and Abdullah Gadiri. But if you want to, we can, we can take that up later as well. Um, Perejana's collages and tableaus, I argue, can also, uh, also call upon objects to sound. Offering a play between still frames as well as characters and their setting in order to reimagine the experience of marginalization from a hegemonic Soviet patriarchy and instead inventing the structures of new forms of effective belonging in his cinematic sensuous thought. Indeed, here we might pause to consider contemporary theories of queer temporality and visual culture from Jose Munoz's vision of a black queer futurity and cruising utopia, or Utopian Bishkek, a queer utopian imaginary set in Bishkek by art activists and thinkers, Georgi Mahmedov and Oksana Shatlatova, um, uh, Shatalova, following a line of Frankfurt School thought, particularly in Bloch's Principle of Hope and Moton's Black radical improvisational aesthetic. Munoz's queer futurity rejects the stasis of rigid formations of identity politics, anti-relationality, and the attendant state of queer, of, of political nihilism that's engulfing contemporary American politics. Queerness, he writes, should and could be a desire for another way of being in both the world and time, a desire that risks mandates to accept that which is not enough. Munoz draws on Bloch's conception of concrete utopia as, a relational, as, as relational to historically situated struggles, a collectivity that is actualized or potential, achieved through the anticipatory, uh, effective structures of hope. Uh, Shatalova and Mahmedov instead locate utopia along the very pivot of Soviet internationalist ideology, framing what they call the framing what they call the queer communist idea through psychologist Yevol uh, Ilyenkov's theory of personality, as well as the social determinist and anti-essentialist vision of subjecthood that challenges biological determinism and identitarian politics of similarity. Shatalova and Mahmedov is a form of collectivity that invokes an alternative internationalism, one in which the individual, individual needs are not subordinated to a universal goal, but rather each particular is taken as a universal. They write, Ilenkovian personality is formed by a system of relations with other people through their shared historical concrete social reality. Indeed, Shatalova and Mahmedov's model shares with cinematic sensuous thought a common connection to Vygotsky's Marxist psychoanaly psychoanalytic vision of the human subject as the product of historical social relationships. While following Marxist theory, Ilenkov was also explicitly motivated by an ethical imperative to resist fascism. Perejanov's critique of the Soviet nationalities and forms of colonial assimilation thus reject, relies on an ex, in reinscription of politics in the effective registers of his cinematic tableau to conjure his poetry from the future, a poetry that resonates today. Perejanov draws on the principles of inner or sensuous thought to reflect on the process of poetic creation, focusing on the inner reflective life of the poet, Syed Nova, and the spiritual journey of Ashik Karib. Syed Nova is organized around a sequence of non-narrative tableau depicting the poet's childhood, his encounter with his beloved princess, Anna, in court, and his spiritual enlightenment, and then his death. 
Despite the film's focus on an inner life narrative, linear life narrative rather, the tableau form creates a dynamic suspension that relies on poetic and folkloric temporality. The centrality of the poetic, both to the form and subject of the films, disconnects the representation of love from a heteronormative, reproductive temporality and a static vision of a national historical past. Instead, the films situate love within the vital stillness of the viewer's experience of the present. And in the words of Shabvladova and Madhmedov, a future imaginary of a queer communist idea. In this sequence from Yeah, this sequence from Syed Nova, entitled The Poet's Youth, introduces the poet's discovery of verse through the inspiration of his beloved. The poet identified by the symbols of his art, rose, candle, book, and skull, embodies the simultaneity of life and death intertwined in, in art. The flatness of the frames, like much of Parajanov's work, recalls the genre of Persian miniatures through the poet's henna-tinted palms, the resemblance between lover and beloved, who are here played by, this, by the same actress, and their costuming drawn from Ghazar paintings and futuristic fantasy. A tableau of the poet in a striped blue dress with a white fez cuts to a tableau of his beloved, her hair and hands covered in a white headdress and gloves, necklace and chin strap, link, and a chin strap link of golden balls. Instead, striped fabrics are, were identified with, um, were, these striped fabrics that you see in the, in the um, in the film are of course not historical, but were are rather identified with a, with uh, an image of social outcasts, which since the Middle Ages include prostitutes, jugglers, clowns, cripples, and then of course um, since the 1800s with prisons. The scene is set in an empty white room, evoking the two-dimensionality of a blank canvas. However, the subtle forces of nature generate non-narrative linkages between the shots. A slight breeze ruffles the leaves of the book, evoking a romantic vision of nature at the heart of poetic inspiration. The cut from the beloved back to the poet replaces the string of lace against her heart with a shell, which the poet cradles against his left breast. The contours of the shell evoke the shape of the beloved's breast, gesturing toward the lover's longing as a thing of nature rendered visible in the poetic linkages between the still tableau. In this way, the set of shots offers a fluid representation of gender and alternative forms of intimacy. The poet lover's longing and nonverbal gesture formulates the character's relationship in the momentary suspension between cinematic tableau. A sheik is also, um, a sheik also presents a similar sequence of stages of poetic inspiration, including the poet falling in love, leaving the garden of his home and becoming a sh an ashik, being enslaved by Nader Shah, recovering his faith, and then returning to his beloved, Michael Magiri. While in Sayat Nova, the tableau is generated through still shots, which portray the poet lover's contemplative states. In ashik, the poet lover is presented through pan shots and jump cuts between cinematic tableau, paintings, and sculpture. For example, the living yet still tableau of the betrothal, oh, this was previously here, cuts to wide shots of, of sculptures of fruit and gajar paintings of lovers. Yeah. Perjanov draws on the stillness of his shots and the interconnection between media and genre to highlight Ashik's emotions. The sensuousness of the tableau in this way captures the journey um, through the inner struggle to reconcile his experience as a stranger. His sadness is articulated in his capture by Nadir Shah's guards in which he is compared to a gazelle. The hunt for the gazelle, of course, being central somatic in, in Arabic, Persian, and, and, and Turkic poetry, um, <clears throat> in which the lover, uh, the poet lover, Ashik's pursuit of the beloved also in Sufi poetry, a symbol for, for God is told through the poetic form of the ghazal or love ballad. Lermontov's vision of the story 
also opens, interestingly, with a sheik on a hunt for gazelles. In Parajanov's film, the roles are inverted, and a sheik becomes the beloved gazelle. There you have, um, this is the uh, sequence of, of, of a sheik's capture. After sneaking into Nader Shah's palace, the guards capture him. And here he is. And the capture is then juxtaposed against a painting of a hunted gazelle and comparing a sheik to the idea of the trapped beloved as well as the ornament of the gazelle painting. You'll see this in a minute. The representation of a sheik as the beloved subverts a vision of Soviet masculinity as the basis of the new Soviet man. Indeed, throughout the film, a sheik is presented as an object of desire, for, as, for instance, in long shots that linger over his half-naked body, cast in languorous reclining poses, or adorned in ornate wedding dress that mirrors his sister's. Parajanov's poetic reflection on Ashik's journey centers on this inversion of lover and beloved, action and thought, as well as the relationship between the ornamental object and the poet as subject. The theme of gender inversion also is also developed in Parajanov's collage work of the same period, such as Remorse and St. George in Blue, which feature homoerotic elements, it, which is throughout much of his work, not just in this period. Remorse, which draws on the material from Renaissance painting, depicts a bearded man adorned with a bejeweled earring kissing a youth whose beauty is marked by a rose on his cheek. St. George in blue refers perhaps at once to Picasso's blue period and the Russian ter uh, slang term for gay or golo boy, light blue, as the saint decorated with lace. Indeed, lace recurs in many of Parajanov's scenes of love. In The Color of Pomegranates, Lace articulates the transition between shots and gender fluidity of lover and beloved, both played by Sophie Cotrelli. In this sense, the, the ornamentation of the queer subject and the emphasis on the elision between spiritual and poetic inspiration function through the eroticism of Parajanov's performative exoticism. Parajanov thus relies on the cinematic tableau, particularly in Ashik Kirib, to project a post-nationalist ethno-futurist imaginary onto the present space of the worn, torn Caucasus. In the final sequence of Ashik, entitled Honors to the Bride's Father, an, an, an older Ashik holds a dove, kisses its head, and sends it flying straight into the camera's gaze. The dove flutters and settles finally on the camera lens. The, she the scene cuts to black with a dedication to the memory of Andrei Tarkovsky. The bride's dowry, a dove, is Parajanov's gift to Tarkovsky and perhaps to cinema itself. The final gesture in turn reveals the cinematic gaze as the strange lover to whom our sheik sends his final affections. To invoke Eisenstein and the poetic school, the scene frames Parajanov's project as a whole to imagine a world defined not by Soviet or national ideologies or gender norms, but by love, desire, and a hope to foster in the very sensuousness of cinema, the dynamic social relations between viewer, camera, and image it generates. I'd like to close by returning to the opening call from Marx for a, poeti a, a poetry from the future. My discussion of Parajanov's sensuous cinematic aesthetics thus also speaks to a future imaginary of new forms of political solidarity, so critical not only to historical anti-fascist movements, but to their renewed necessity today. This not only entails a project of queer world making, but an attempt to recover other worlds lost to disciplinary divide, or to the declining value of philology more generally. The study of Central Asia and the Caucasus should endure not only because it introduces a lesser known archive, but because alternative visions of subjecthood 
but because it offers alternative visions of subjecthood that challenge the role of literature and art in reimagining historical and contemporary models of the state, citizenship, and forms of belonging that are so necessary to any hope for the future.